Hello class, this is Demetrius Wilson. This is Business Marketing. We are now on to Chapter 8, Using Marketing Channels to Create Value for Customers. Our learning objectives are explain why marketing channel decisions can result in the success or failure of products. If you don't know how your product should be marketed or where uh, things about it should be communicated, then you're going to have a problem uh, with uh, in the sales aspect. But if you get it right, and you say online is the best place for this or brick and mortar is the best place for that, then you have success. Understand how supply chains differ from marketing channels and describe different types of organizations that work together as channel partners and what each does, right? So remember, partners doesn't mean you're necessarily from the same organization. It means that you're working together uh, for a greater good. Consumer behavior. Today's consumers are used to getting what they want, when they want it, where they want it, otherwise uh, than buying a competing product, right? So people just want so much these days that if you're not giving them exactly what they want, they're going elsewhere. Uh, getting a product in a timely manner to the consumer requires distribution channels. Uh, you have someone in New York and you're in California, how are you going to quickly get them that hoverboard? Uh, even though I think hoverboards are illegal uh, in New York. Uh, marketing channels. So the simplest marketing channel uh, consists of a producer and a consumer. I make the good, you buy the good and, and use it. Uh, most products involve other parties called intermediaries who are positioned between the producer and the consumer. So the people who's in between me creating it and you may be going to pavilions and purchasing it. There are four for forms of utility or value that the channels offer. Time, form, place, and ownership, right? Think about it. everything, you know, revolves around time. It's time is money. All right, a uh, place, where is this being sold at? Ownership, who owns it at what specific time or does someone own it all the way through up until it gets sold? Marketing channels versus supply chains. In the past few decades, organizations have begun taking a more holistic uh, look at their marketing channels. So we're gonna look at everything together. Uh, they have begun looking at all organizations that figure into a part of the process of uh, producing, promoting, and delivering offering to its user, right? So we're gonna look at everybody who touches our product whether they're the company that delivers our product in the truck to the grocery store or the company that drops off the wood so we can create our product. Our firms are constantly monitoring their supply chains and tinkering with them uh, so they are efficient as possible. Uh, this process is called uh, supply chain management, which obviously makes sense. Uh, channel partners, as I referred to earlier, uh, they are essential for marketing uh, to achieve its objectives, having the right product in the right place at the right time like everybody type of channel partners. So we have our wholesalers on one side and retailers on the other. Uh, so for wholesalers, obtain large quantities, uh, the store and uh, break down into smaller units. I mean, they, so meaning they store the units and they break them down into smaller units. Uh, take title to goods, so they actually own the goods. Assume risk of selling and obsolesce, uh, obs obsolescence. So, uh, so they take the risk. So if they have, um, let's say, a um, hundred thousand Snuggies on, on board, and then someone says, hey, Snuggies are toxic and you can't wear them anymore, then they they have ownership of those Snuggies and they're, you know, they're not going to be able to, to unload them or, or dump them elsewhere. So, you know, so they do as, assume a, a bit of risk. Um, three basic types, uh, merchant, wholesalers, brokers, and manufacturers, they're all, uh, and, and manufacturer agents, right? Those are different types of wholesalers. Uh, retailers uh, buy products from wholesalers, uh, agents, or distributors, and then sell them to consumers. Uh, they vary by the type of products they sell, their sizes, prices they charge, level of service, convenience, or uh, the speed they offer. Right? So Amazon, you typically get things very quickly. Uh, if I buy it from somewhere else, maybe it doesn't get to uh, my house or to my business location uh, in, in, a, in a more prompt manner. Uh, types of wholesalers, uh, merchant wholesalers, they're full service, offer stock inventories, operate warehouses, and supply credit to the buyers. Uh, limited service, uh, they offer fewer services to their customers, but they have lower prices. Uh, examples, cash and carry wholesalers, drop shippers. Uh, mail order whole wholesalers uh, sell their products uh, using catalogs and ship products to buyers, right? So we're going to send you a catalog, pick what you like, we're going to uh, send it out to you. And rack jobbers, I've talked about this in other in previous chapters. They sell specialty products such as books, hosiery, and magazines. They drop the rack there. Here are all the magazines 
They come back, they take inventory, say you sold 15, you owe me the money for 15. Uh, brokers and direct sales. Uh, brokers are agents, and, and California is very uh, broker-centric. Uh, they don't purchase or take title to the products they sell. Their role is limited to negotiating sales uh, contracts for the producers. Uh, the most common form of agent and uh, broker uh, consumers encounter are uh, in real estate, right? So, you know, the thing about a real estate agent is going is they're not going to buy the house and then sell it to you, right? Uh, manufacturers, uh, sales offices and branches are selling units that work directly uh, for manufacturers. Uh, these are found in business to business settings. Different types of retailers, uh, supermarkets, and grocery stores, self-service retailers provide full range of food and household products. Convenience stores, consumers pay for the convenience of the form of higher, uh, they pay for the convenience in the form of higher markups on products because it's right there, right? So that's what you're paying for. You're paying for the actual convenience. 7 Eleven is right there on the corner. Uh, specialty stores, they sell a certain type of product, uh, but they usually carry a deep line of it. So, you know, a lot of different, you know, varieties of it, uh, different shapes, sizes, and color, but the same type of uh, specialty. Uh, department stores, they carry a wide variety of household products and merchandise. Uh, types of retailers, so you have superstores, oversized department stores that carry a broad array of general merchandise as well as groceries, warehouse clubs, so super centers that sell products at a discount, right? So think about uh, Costco, Sam's Club. Off-price retailers, uh, stores that have a variety or sell a variety of uh, discount merchandise. Outlet stores, uh, everybody who likes to shop likes the outlets. Uh, discount retailers uh, that operated under the brand name of a single manufacturer selling products that couldn't be sold through normal retail channels uh, due to mistakes made in manufacturing. So let's say, you know, something slight, very slight went wrong. We could sell it uh, at the um, at the outlet as opposed to selling it at the Nike store. Uh, online retailers, so they uh, sell products online, obviously e-commerce and used uh, retailers sell used products. And you think about that like uh, play it against sports, for instance. Uh, they have all these products that, you know, so many people buy these uh, treadmills, kettlebells, everything else. And then they say, you know what, I'm tired of this. Uh, I don't want any more. And they sell it to play it against sports. And I'll tell you right now, you go in there, those things are, you know, it's just as good as buying it brand new from somewhere because uh, people really haven't used them that much. Non-store retailing. Not all retailing is conducted through stores, right? That should be obvious. Uh, there's a growing trend in door-to-door -door sales, right? It, it, once upon in my career, uh, first, fresh out of college, I did uh, do door-to-door -door sales. Uh, party selling, right? We're having a Tupperware party and other types of parties, and we're trying to make sales there. Selling via catalogs, selling via TV, infomercials. I'm notorious for buying things off of infomercials. And uh, telemarketing, people, you know, dialing for dollars, calling your house uh, right as you're about to eat dinner and uh, asking, do you want to uh, buy a cruise? Uh, so key takeaways is always how a product moves from a raw material to finished good uh, to the consumer, right? So it goes from the producer to consumer, but a lot of times there are things all the way in between, and those are the things that we're discussing. So read the key takeaways. It's not even that long of a key takeaway uh, slide, and make sure that you, uh, you know, uh, retain all that information. More learning objectives. Uh, describe the basic types of channels uh, to business to consumer and business to business. We've already talked about that B2C business to consumer, B2B business to business. Explain the advantages and challenges companies face when using multiple channels and alternate channels, right? So what, what do you run into? You run into problems because these two channels don't, uh, they don't get along or, or, or members in your channel. Uh, explain the pros and cons of uh, this intermediation uh, and list the channel firms uh that lists the channels firms can use to enter into foreign markets, right? So the different ways to get into foreign markets, a lot of times you don't want to open up a brand new plant in China. You might want to just say, hey, I want to do some foreign direct investment. I want to invest in a, in a, in a company that's already out there and, and they know the lay of the land. They can do things a lot better for me. Uh, direct versus indirect channels. So direct channels, uh, typically this is a transaction between the producer and the end user. A company that fields uh, sales force is an example of direct channel, right? So I buy, I, you know, pay a sales force, they sell, and I'm the producer, and they sell to you, the consumer. Indirect consists of intermediaries uh, between the producer and the user. Some indirect channels take title, right? So they, that means that they own them at the time, and others, uh, such as agents, uh, do not take title. Uh, so I want you to pause this and review this on your own. So there are the typical channels in business to consumer markets. So you see, you have at the, you know, at the simplest form, in the simplest form, producer to consumer, but then you have producer to retailer to consumer, producer to wholesaler to retailer to consumer, producer to distributor to retailer to consumer, 
uh, producer to the agents, right? They get it to the wholesaler distributor, to the retailer, to consumer. So I want you to take some time to review that. But it's not to say any of these are right or wrong. It's just to say that these are the different options that you may see out there. These are typical channels in business to business markets. So uh, prior, that was business to consumers. This is business to business markets, right? So producer goes straight to business or government user, producer, agent or broker, business or government user, uh, producer uh, goes to end distributor, distributor, then it goes to business or government user, uh, and then you have these channels. So I want you to review that as well. So this intermediation. So this is a situation that occurs when intermediaries are cut out of the marketing channel, right? So like a full house cuts you out, they just cut them out. Say, so you know, we don't need you anymore. Uh, we used to uh, have Amazon uh, ship the wood from the company to us. Now, instead, we moved our company next door to the company who has the wood. So they just bring it next door and we use it. We cut them out of the of the channel. Uh, some companies take on middleman's roles uh, to reduce costs and improve profits. Some of them think they can do it and don't do it successfully. Uh, the trend today is towards disintermediation. Uh, the Internet is a facilitator, right? So why do all that when I could just, you know, uh, give me a nice fancy website and sell everything from there? And it's not always cost effective or efficient because sometimes people don't know what they're doing. Multiple and alternate channels. So marketing channels can become complex and confusing. Relationships between wholesalers, retailers, and brokers. Obviously, a lot of hands in the pot. You know, sometimes uh, people get burnt. Uh, multiple channels can be effective, but it requires channel management. Right, You have to have somebody in charge of that. Understanding different target markets. Companies work hard to try to integrate their selling channels so users get a consistent experience. So if you buy something from our Internet site or if you buy it from Macy's, you get the same type of experience. Uh, some companies find ways to increase their sales by forming strategic channel alliances with one another. Right, We're going to uh, get together and say, you know, what, this is strategic. So sometimes companies, they merge completely or one buys the other one. Right. Direct TV is now an AT&T company. Right. Are there advantages of that? Yes, there definitely are advantages of, of those two uh, being aligned together. And even less than that, you know, just just being strategic in, in what you do. Like, so just think about when iPhone came out, they were strategically aligned with just AT&T. It's like, oh, you know what? Uh, I can't get an iPhone except for from AT&T. So I'm going to go over to AT&T and get an iPhone as opposed to being with T-Mobile. International marketing channels. Uh, company growth requires participation in international markets. Uh, developing nations may lack good intermediary system, right? So you might not have the right people over there. So you might have to invest and create your own, you know, situation over there. Uh, some countries have extensive distribution avenues that must be navigated. Uh, sometimes they may not be navigated in the manner in which you think it should be, uh, such as the greasing of certain palms to get things from the docks uh, into the stores uh, in other in foreign countries. Uh, direct foreign investment, joint ventures, exporting products and franchising. Those are different ways to get your foothold into the international market. More key takeaways. Be sure to review these. They will help you on your quizzes, help you on your tests. A direct marketing channel consists of just two parties, the producer and the consumer in its most basic form. Read the rest of the key takeaways. Like I said, it's very, very good information for you. More learning objectives. Uh, describe the activities performed in channels and explain uh, which organizations perform which functions. Uh, so you have the push versus the pull strategies, and we, we've already gone over this, but uh, they'll touch on it a few times to, uh, throughout this course. Uh, the push strategy, uh, push strategy uh, manufacturer uh, convinces wholesalers, distributors, or retailers to sell its products, right? So we're not talking to consumers. We're talking to the, you know, the, the intermediaries in between, and we say, hey, you know what? This is a great product. This is why you should sell it, and then they do. The pull strategy creates demand for a product among consumers so that the businesses agree to sell the product. Well, if everybody wants a product, of course, Macy's is going to sell my product. Uh, channel functions. So you want to sort and regroup products, uh, store and manage inventory, distribute products, assume ownership. Right. So we talked about taking title and risk, extend credit and aid in possession, uh, share marketing and other information. Right. So, for instance, like, uh, you know, like Subway, you share in the marketing. One you know, commercial goes up for Subway. It helps all the Subways that are out there. And assume uh, assure availability to end users, right? Those those are the functions of the various channels. <clears throat> More learning uh, learning objectives. Uh, describe the factors uh, that affect the firm's channels decisions. Uh, so a lot of different factors could be price, could be cost, uh, which two different things uh, could be a profit level. Uh, explain how intensive, exclusive, and selective distribution differ from one another. 
and explain why some uh, products are better suited to some distribution strategies than others, right? So think about it. They pay a lot of experts to figure out what's the best way to market this, what's the best way to sell this, and that's the, the avenue in which you should go, or at least the avenue the majority of your sales should go. Uh, channel selection uh, factors. <clears throat> Type of consumer, so you have consumer or business. Remember I said B2C business to consumer, B2B business to business, could be B2G business to government. Uh, customer preferences, uh, type of product, could be perishables, uh, valuable or, or fragile uh, products that are in there like Mikasa. Uh, channel partner capabilities, uh, channel and uh, company abilities, and target market reach. So are you reaching your intended target? Channel selection factor, factors, uh, the business environment and technology, the state of the economy, right? So if the economy is down, it could have an effect on your business. Uh, foreign exchange rates, uh, the enabling abilities of the Internet, uh, <clears throat> competing products, uh, marketing channels. So how do competitors sell their products? Uh, right. So this, if everybody else is on the Internet, maybe you should put your product in the store and see how many buys you get there. Maybe just do it as a test market. Um, sometimes a unique channel offers competitive advantages just like that. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of companies have been successful in doing so. Uh, factors of a product intensity of, of distribution. So intensive uh, distribution firms that choose an intensive distribution strategy try to sell their products to as many outlets as possible. Everybody take it. Everybody stock our product. We're pushing them out to everybody. Selective distribution, a little bit different. Selective distribution involves selling products. Uh, at select outlets in specific locations, so only certain places. And exclusive is even more exclusive uh, distribution. Exclusive distribution involves selling products through one on uh, one or very few outlets. It could just be we're only selling it at this place, and that's it. Uh, and they they definitely get a lot of business, and they would like that because people are going to be there, and they're going to buy other things from their store. Uh, more key takeaways: uh, selecting the best uh, marketing channel is critical because it can mean the uh, difference between success or failure of your product. Right, so be sure to read the key takeaways. Can't emphasize enough how that will help you on your quiz. <clears throat> Learning objectives again: uh, explain what channel power is and the types of firm that firms that wield it, uh, like wielding a uh, Thor's hammer. Uh, describe the types of conflicts that can occur in marketing channels. Describe the ways in which channel members achieve cooperation uh, with one another. Uh, so channel power. Uh, strong channel partners become leaders. Uh, leaders can uh, call the shots, right, uh, getting what they want. So, if, you know, we're strongest and we, you know, we're, we're the key component, the key, uh, you know, uh, uh, key company to the, to the success of your business. Then yes, we can definitely call some shots. Uh, category killers, uh, they definitely have, uh, have channel power. So if they can just kind of kibosh and destroy everything. Then, you know, like say, you know, you're dealing with a, a trucking company and they ship all of your stuff and they say, hey, we're going on strike unless you give us some more money. Then you kind of have to give them a little bit more money until you find a contingency or backup plan. A channel conflict, uh, disputes among channel members. Channel members have uh, their own goals, uh, which may not uh, be shared. Uh, arise when uh, producers compete with channel members, like I talked about. Selling, I'm selling on my internet site, but I'm also giving you the goods to sell out of your brick and mortar uh, department store. Uh, channel conflicts can also occur when manufacturers sell their products online, just as I uh, just indicated. Uh, vertical versus horizontal uh, conflict. So vertical up and down, horizontal side by side, east to west. Vertical conflict occurs between two different types of members in a channel, right? So we do totally different types. Uh, you know, and the people who do the trucking and the people who do uh, the packaging don't get along. Uh, horizontal conflict means between organizations of the same type. Uh, so one type of horizontal conflict is much more difficult to manage uh, is uh, is dumping. Uh, and dumping, you talked about in the other business, business classes, is taking a product and saying, you know what, we're going to take it over to Japan and we're going to sell it for a lot cheap so we can just get rid of them. Uh, practice of selling large quantity of goods at a lower uh, the price too low to be economically justifiable in another country. Achieving channel cooperation ethically, and that's ideally what you want, doesn't always happen, but you should try to achieve it and you should try to achieve it ethically. Uh, emphasize the benefits of working together, assure channel members of uh, product genuineness, uh, provide channel members with promotional material, educating channel members on the products and selling techniques, uh, offer channel partners uh, monetary incentives, Avoid channel stuffing, uh, moving product into a channel to record sales, right? You don't want to do that. You don't want to say, hey, oh, we sold all these, and that's what I'm telling my investors. No, you didn't. You just sent them over uh, to your next channel, and they haven't sold them, so you really haven't truly gotten paid on those. 
uh, handle handle uh, pricing issues in an ethical and legal manner. And that's anything. You should always do things in an ethical and legal manner. Channel integration. Another way to foster uh, cooperation in a channel is to establish a vertical mar marketing system. Uh, in a vertical marketing system, channel members formally agree to closely cooperate with each other. So we're writing on pen and paper that we're going to we're going to agree to work closely together and get this right. Vertical marketing system can also be created by one channel member uh, taking over the functions of another member. Uh, this is a form of disintermediation uh, known as vertical integration, meaning, hey, you know, we're going to step in. We're going to take this kind of carve you out of the process. A vertical integration can be forward or downstream. Uh, channel integration, a uh, backward integration occurs when a company moves upstream in the supply chain, that is uh, toward the beginning, right? So we're going to move up toward the beginning closer to uh, where the producer is. Uh, in a conventional marketing system, the channel members have no affiliation with one another, right? We don't have any affiliation with one another. Uh, we're just doing our job as different cogs in the, you know, the wheel going around for the entire channel. All the members operate independently. A horizontal marketing system is one in which two companies at the same channel le uh, level agree to cooperate with another, one another uh, to sell products or to make the most of their marketing opportunities. So we're just going to go ahead and agree to, to work together and make the most of our marketing opportunities. So, uh, for instance, like you, you see at certain schools, they only have uh, Pepsi and say, hey, this is all that you can have. Uh, you know, because we're sponsoring this, we're giving this amount of money. It, it, it's none of that. I think at Disneyland, it's only Coke. All you see is, is, is Coke there. And I believe a, a certain amount of that is, is actually free, which is very interesting. Uh, this is sometimes called a horizontal integration. Uh, last but not least, uh, slide number 40. And uh, for chapter eight, key takeaways, channel partners that will channel power are referred to as channel leaders. And if you're if that person or that company, you want to be a channel leader. So read the rest of the key takeaways. As always, they will give you great insight and tips uh, for uh, your quizzes and your tests. So that's the end of chapter eight, uh, 40 slides down. I know it's a little bit longer than chapter seven, but it wasn't too, too long. Uh, so uh, think about it. You have 16 chapters. It's chapter eight. Halfway through, be sure to take your quiz, uh, do all of your appropriate reading, uh, a test, uh, a notification of a test will be coming out uh, soon. And like I said, that test will be on chapters uh, five, six, seven, and eight. But for now, uh, you just have uh, your quizzes that will be due for chapters uh, seven and eight uh, for, for this week. Uh, so uh, that should be it for, uh, for that. If you have any questions, as always, uh, feel free to call me. Uh, but uh, also, as always, I want you guys to all have a good day and a great week.